In this video, we will give an introductory overview of thyroid eye disease, otherwise known as Graves' ophthalmopathy or thyroid-associated orbitopathy. Our objectives are as follows. To describe how the orbital anatomy is relevant to the development of thyroid eye disease in the bulging eye, to discover the pathogenesis of thyroid eye disease, to identify the symptomatology of thyroid eye disease, and to discover the clinical approach to evaluating and treating thyroid eye disease. Before moving further, it will be helpful to review the orbital anatomy to better illustrate how it is relevant to thyroid eye disease and the bulging look that often accompanies it. In a process that will be described on the following slide, the volume of the orbital fat and all of the extraocular muscles, including those not shown in this sagittal view of the orbit, as well as the levator, is increased. This swelling can push the contents of the orbit forward, leading to the bulging look often seen with this disease. It can also lead to the symptomatology discussed later in this presentation, including vision loss as the optic nerve is compressed. We will now look at the pathogenesis that was alluded to on the previous slide. Autoantibodies directed against receptors, most often the thyroid-stimulating hormone receptor, present in the thyroid cells may also target thyroid-stimulating hormone receptors on the surface of the cells behind the eyes, namely fibroblasts and adipocytes. There are two subtypes of these antibodies. Thyroid stimulating immunoglobulins, TSI, which directly activate thyroid stimulating hormone receptor, and thyroid stimulating hormone receptor binding inhibitory immunoglobulins, TBII, which prevent thyroid stimulating hormone from binding to its receptor. Both are positively correlated with the clinical activity and severity of thyroid eye disease and can be detected in up to 98% of affected patients. These thyroid stimulating hormone receptor antibodies and cytokines from activated T cells lead to fibroblast activation and secretion of hydrophilic glycosaminoglycans, which accumulate in the extraocular muscles and retroocular tissue along with excess fluid as the osmotic pressure increases, leading to swelling and increased pressure. This figure demonstrates the appearance of normal extraocular muscles. This figure shows the marked swelling of the retroorbital muscles, often well visualized on MRI or CT scanning. The consequences of retroorbital swelling is bulging of the eye, called proptosis or exophthalmos, not well illustrated here since this may depend on both the anatomy of the orbit and the degree of swelling. Now we arrive at the myriad of possible symptoms this disease can produce. Proptosis or exophthalmos, which is the bulging discussed previously. Lid retraction. Periorbital edema. Tearing. A gritty or foreign object sensation in the eyes. Blurring of vision. The tearing, grittiness, and blurriness can be due to dryness which occurs because the lids are retracted and cannot blink properly because the tear-producing glands have been affected by the autoimmune process and aren't functioning well and or because the forward bulging of the eyes prevents them from being completely covered by the lids. Eye or retroocular discomfort or pain due to inflammation and swelling. Restriction of eye movements, which can lead to diplopia or double vision. Color vision desaturation or dyschromatopsia, which may be an early sign of optic neuropathy and may progress to further vision loss. But how will a physician or precocious medical student make the diagnosis of this disease? Thyroid eye disease is typically diagnosed clinically by the combination of the characteristic ocular abnormalities described on the previous slide and hyperthyroidism labs, which we most commonly think of as low TSH and high free T4 and T3, although these may all be normal in an affected patient. Progressive proptosis should encourage testing for TSH receptor antibodies, usually the thyroid-stimulating immunoglobulin subtype mentioned previously when discussing pathogenesis. It is, however, important to rule out nonspecific signs of thyroid hormone excess, such as lid retraction, temporal flare, and lid lag, without the associated bulging of the eyes. The figure showing lid retraction and temporal flare below highlights this. Imaging can help with differential diagnosis, but is more often used to assess the risk of optic nerve compression by enlarging extraocular muscles and retroocular tissues. Here is another example of massively enlarged extraocular muscles, with the red arrow point pointing at the swollen medial rectus muscle on each side. With so many possible symptoms and the sometimes waxing and waning course of this disease, an objective measure of disease activity is commonly assessed using a clinical activity score. First-time patients are assessed on seven possible findings, and subsequent assessments add an additional three. Scores greater than or equal to three out of seven for first-time patients, or greater than or equal to four out of ten for subsequent assessments, correlate with active disease and likelihood of response to immunomodulatory therapies, such as corticosteroids. Now that we have a way to diagnose thyroid eye disease, as well as disease activity and severity, we should discuss treatment. 
Treatment can be divided into two phases, treatment of the active, inflammatory eye disease phase, and treatment of the stable, post-inflammatory remission phase. The active period can last up to two to three years and requires careful monitoring until stable. Treatment during this time should focus on preserving sight and the integrity of the cornea, as well as providing treatment for double vision when it interferes with daily functioning and becomes bothersome. Treatment during the remission phase that lasts indefinitely in most cases involves correcting unacceptable permanent changes that persist after the ocular conditions of the active phase have stabilized. This image illustrates the symptom severity possible during the active phase. And this image illustrates the appearance of the stable phase with some lid retraction or possibly mild proptosis. Now let's take a close look at the components of active phase treatment. One of the most important steps is hyperthyroidism reversal. None of these hyperthyroidism reversal methods directly improve thyroid eye disease. Also be wary that hypothyroidism can cause fluid retention and worsen disease course, so thyroid function monitoring is critical. It is critical to counsel your patients on smoking cessation. Studies have shown that cessation reduces the severity of disease as well as the duration of activity, degree of scarring, and risk of optic nerve involvement. It also increases the likelihood of response to anti-inflammatory therapy. Measures more local to the eye can be used to reduce ocular surface irritation. Photophobia and sensitivity to wind or cold air can be relieved by the use of artificial tears and sunglasses, while an elevated head position during sleep can help with the retroocular pressure or pain. Treatment of inflammation and swelling in the perioral tissues can be managed with Corticosteroids are severe enough, although clinicians should use with caution as the side effects are often worse than the disease symptoms. Steroids are usually reserved as a temporizing measure in patients with compressive optic neuropathy until surgical decompression of the orbit is performed, or orbital decompression surgery in which the roof, lateral wall, or medial wall of the orbit is removed. Temporary treatment of diplopia or double vision can be achieved through occlusion therapy, often in the form of an eye patch or scotch tape over the patient's glasses on one side, or the use of prisms, either temporary ones that can be stuck onto the patient's glasses or prisms ground into the lens of the glass directly. Surgery is usually saved until after the disease has stabilized. We are going to wrap things up by discussing possible options for treatment during the stable remission phase, all of which are surgical in nature. For patients with proptosis, the orbital decompression surgery mentioned on the previous slide can be offered. The removal of the roof, lateral, or medial walls of the orbit free the expanded retroocular tissues from their limited confines. One problem with this surgery is it can lead to strabismus or double vision in some patients. This brings us to our next possible treatment option, strabismus surgery. The goal of strabismus surgery is to realign the eyes relative to each other. This is done primarily by weakening or loosening the extraocular muscles of the eye. Weakening is done primarily by a technique called recession, in which extraocular muscle is detached from the surface of the eye and reattached farther back. Lastly, eyelid surgery can be performed to correct for lid retraction or periorbital edema. This is done last because the strabismus surgery may alter the position of the eyelid. So to wrap up our discussion of thyroid eye disease, we described how the volume of the orbital fat and all of the extraocular muscles can become enlarged. We discovered together how autoantibodies mostly thyroid-stimulating hormone receptor antibodies, as well as cytokines from activated T-cells, lead to fibroblast activation and secretion of hydrophilic glycosaminoglycans. We discovered the symptoms of thyroid eye disease, including, but certainly not limited to, proptosis, lid retraction, and periorbital edema. And lastly, we discovered the use of a clinical activity score, as well as treatment options that depend on the stage of the disease and range from non-invasive local measures to systemic medications to surgery.